Christ. Now, here in the second half of chapter 19, guess what? We have the return of Jesus Christ. And uh, look forward to looking at that tonight. Before we do, I wanted to uh, open up with uh, some lyrics from an old song. I wonder how many of you, how many of you have ever heard of, if, if you're familiar with Christian music on, on the radio, not necessarily church music, but Christian music on the radio, uh, I'm going back when I y- use this person's name, Larry Norman. Anybody ever heard of Larry Norman? Okay, well, he, um, he had a song, I think this is late 60s, sometime in the 70s, and then um, by the time I came along, then DC Talk did a version of it, I just dated myself, and um, uh, it's fun talking to my uh, kids about um, Toby Mac, because they're like, oh, we like Toby Mac, and I'm like, yeah, I used to be in a group called DC Talk, really, you know, you know, anyway. But uh, Larry Norman wrote a song called I Wish We'd All Been Ready. And it says, it's, <laughs> it was very descriptive when he wrote it. It's very descriptive if you think about what's going on in the world now. It says, life was filled with guns and war, and all of us got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. The children died, the days grew cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. And the refrain is, there's no time to change your mind the sun has come and you've been left behind. Uh, it keeps going on. It says, a man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise and turns her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears. One left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. Um, really neat little tune. But <clears throat> what I want to say is as we prepare to look at the return of Jesus Christ, I want you to keep this thought in your mind. Are you ready? Because I don't want anybody to be alive on earth when he does come, and they're not ready, and all they have to say is, I sure do wish we'd all been ready, you know? So don't lose sight of that. As we prepare to read uh, the second half of Revelation 19, I like what Dennis Johnson said. Um, here in Revelation 19, verse 10, it says, uh, you know, John's having another vision, and he says, And then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse, and its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war with justice. Now, before we go any further than that, notice he sees heaven opened, okay? This is not the first time he's seen heaven open. Uh, in G- Revelation 4, when John was called to enter the door opened in heaven, to view the throne room of God and the Lamb, he he had a glimpse of God's purpose at work in the world. He saw the unfolding of the seals and the trumpets. And then when you get to Revelation uh, 11, 19, the temple of God in heaven is opened. And it was the prelude to visions uh, visions exposing the cosmic conflict behind everything that we see going on in the world today. Uh, You see the drama of a heavenly woman with a child and then the dragon and the beast and all of that. And then as recent as Revelation 15, 5, uh, the sanctuary of the tent of testimony in heaven, it's opened. And you see the completion of God's wrath uh, destroy um, uh, earth's city, great city, Babylon. And we see the bowls and we see the vision of the harlot. Well, now... Now in Revelation 19, heaven itself is opened and there's a white horse and there's a rider on on that horse. And here John sees our victorious Lord Jesus Christ and his appearance, his names that are mentioned in this passage that we'll see and the companions uh, with him uh, call you and I to rest our hope uh, confidently and completely in God's power to vindicate his saints and to judge his enemies. So let's look at Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. It is a description of the second coming of Christ. Then I saw heaven open, he said, and there was a white horse, and its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war with justice. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 
The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. I love what um, one commentator says. He says, The eyes like blazing fire remind us of Revelation chapter 1 verse 14. Uh, It affirms Christ's ability to see and judge human hearts, not just the outward appearance, but He sees our hearts. And the many crowns on His head indicate that He's got legitimate king authority uh, from the Father. And the name that no one knows except Himself there in verse 12 indicates the full surprising aspect of His coming is still a mystery to us. It can also remind us of His transcendence and His deity And the name Word of God uh, is uh, mentioned also in John 1, 1, uh, John's Gospel. It reminds us of Christ's powerful role in creation and in providence. So by virtue of His divinity and His Lordship, He has the ability to bring to a conclusion the history of the world. And I thought, man, that's good. He is bringing to a conclusion the history of the world. Um, John's first readers would have been challenged to recognize the greatness of Jesus in the scene because he's given a few names. Notice the first name there in verse 11. He's called faithful and true. Um, that, that refers to the fact that he successfully uh, completed his first mission when he came to earth. He was faithful and true to the Father. He came, he lived, he died, he rose again, he ascended to the Father. He said he's coming back, and here he comes back. He is faithful and true. The next uh, name that you see for Jesus is in verse 13. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Well, we know that Jesus is the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14. But uh, the Word of God... Uh, shows that he was at work in creation and he'll also be at work in the final judgment. And then notice uh, the next name Um, in verse 16, King of Kings. Uh, He's superior to all other kings and rulers. And also he's Lord of Lords. He's sovereign over the whole universe. He alone is Lord God Almighty. And then of course we have the unknown name or the secret name there in verse 12 where he had a name written that no one knows except himself and um, that reminds us that there's so much about him that we still can't fathom okay because the finite is trying to understand infinity Uh, God transcends time so you see a lot there about Christ just by looking at the titles and the names that are revealed. As we look at this passage, notice his um, uh, authority. Um, here is this, uh, here's heaven open, there's a white horse, here's the rider, and he judges and he makes war with justice, and he's got many crowns, uh, diadems, if you will, uh, crowns on his head. That shows his authority to rule and his authority to judge. Uh, he, he has the title King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then with justice, he will judge the world and make war. So he has all authority. Notice his victory uh, there in verse 13. He wore a robe dipped in blood. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can look at this. Uh, some, some Bible scholars believe that the robe dipped in blood is kind of like a throwback reference to his work on the cross. But I really don't think that fits here, even though that was key to his victory. Um, when you look at Revelation, realize that a lot in Revelation, uh, a lot of the pictures that you see in Revelation are painted with allusions and references to the Old Testament. This is a perfect example. Um, in Isaiah 63, in Isaiah 63, listen what, what the prophet says in verse 2 through 6. Uh, the prophet says, Why are your clothes red? 
and your garments like one who treads a winepress. I trampled the winepress alone, and no one from the nations was with me. I trampled them in my anger and ground them underfoot in my fury. Their blood splattered my garments And all my clothes were stained. Now this is God talking, and the prophet is speaking God's word. Okay, here is God who's been trampling a winepress. More about that in a minute. And uh, in his fury, and blood splatters on his garments, his clothes are stained. And he says, this is because of the nations, in verse 3. And then he says, for I planned the day of vengeance... And the year of my redemption came. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I was amazed that no one assisted. So my arm accomplished victory for me, and my wrath assisted me. I crushed nations in my anger. I made them drunk with my wrath and poured out their blood on the ground. Sounds a little gory, perhaps, but you no. Know, this is a this is an end time picture that God is showing the prophet Isaiah, and it really does fit. Because keep in mind here, we've already looked at the wine press. Go back to Revelation 14. In Revelation 14, verse 14, John said, I looked and there was a white cloud and one like the Son of Man, that's Jesus, was seated on the cloud with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And an angel came out of the temple, crying out in a loud voice to the one who was seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap, for the time to reap is come, since the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Then another angel, who also had a sharp sickle, came out of the temple in heaven. Yet another angel, who had authority over fire, came from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Use your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the vineyard of the earth because its grapes have ripened. So the angel swung a sickle at the earth and gathered the grapes from the vineyard of the earth and he threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. And then the press was trampled outside the city and blood flowed out of the press up to the horse's bridles for about 180 miles. I certainly think that there is a connection there between the, the great wine press of God's wrath and the blood, and here in Revelation 19. Uh, Again, remember what I mentioned last week. Many times in Revelation, something is um, mentioned or it's announced, and then later on it's um, explained or expanded, and that's what you're seeing here. Um, So you have his authority. You have his victory. With the robe drip, uh, dipped in blood, he shows up and uh, he, he executes his victory. And then notice his army there in Revelation 19. Not that he needs it, but in Revelation 19 verse 14, the armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. And we know what that represents. We saw it last week. It represents the righteousness uh, that we have from God as, as saints. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it and he will rule them with an iron rod and he will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God. See, there's the winepress in verse 15. That's why I think that chapter 19 links to chapter 14, the great winepress of God's wrath. But at any rate, notice his army uh, is surrounding him, but the army doesn't have to fight the battle. He's going to fight the battle, and how's he going to fight the battle? With the sword from his mouth. In other words, all he's got to do is say the word. Just like in creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. All he's got to do is say the word, and it's over. It's over. In Revelation 17, verse 14, again, to illustrate how Many times in Revelation, something is mentioned or announced, and then later it's explained and expanded. Well, if you go back a couple chapters to Revelation 17, uh, verse 14, in the uh, vision of the woman and the scarlet beast, we are told in Revelation 17, 14, these will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will conquer them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. That's 
that's in seed form what you see now here in Revelation 19. You see people ready to make war against the Lamb. And he's also called Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and those with him are called, chosen, and faithful. And so, you know, some think that the army that's gathered around Jesus when he comes is strictly angels. Some think it's the angels and, and us, those who are redeemed. Uh, I would like to think that as well. Um, notice also there are prophecy threads here. This is really good. You see, when you look at what we just read here in uh, Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16, we see his authority with the, the crowns and the King of kings, Lord of lords, with his victory. He speaks the word, and, you know, the battle's over before it begins. You see his army surrounding him, uh, clothed in pure white linen, which represents the righteousness that we receive from God. And now you see prophecy threads. You see, just like an artist... He takes all these different colors and makes this beautiful picture. As we look at this prophetic picture, we see references to other parts of prophecy in the Old Testament. There are four Old Testament allusions that uh, expand the picture of Christ's appearance here in Revelation 19 when he begins to execute judgment. What are they? Well, for instance, the sharp, the, the sword uh, that uh, comes from his mouth. Uh, that refers to Isaiah 49, verse 2, where Isaiah says of God's servant, He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Here, Isaiah's prophecy is reaffirmed, and Jesus is identified as that servant. Um, uh, also, with this sword, the, the writer will smite the nations. He will rule the nations, which alludes to another uh, reference of Isaiah to, cry, uh, of, to Christ. In Isaiah 11.4, uh, it says that he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And the same verse in Isaiah states that God's servant will judge in righteousness. And so we see that here as well. A third thing, the writer will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And that alludes to Psalm 2. You know, Psalm 2 is a very uh, well-known messianic psalm. It's where the Messiah will break the nations with a rod of iron. And the rod of verse 15, like the sword coming from Christ's mouth, connotes God's word and how powerful it is. And finally, the writer treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, which is mentioned there, I believe, in verse 15. The wording is an allusion to the Old Testament prediction of God's last great act of judgment uh, that I read earlier in Isaiah 63, where you're, you're in the wine press and the blood of it gets on his garments. And so all of these images that are in Old Testament prophecy, they collide in this composite picture of when Christ comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords on the white horse in Revelation 19. Now, what happens when he comes? Uh, this is the, the good part. You see the defeat and the destruction of his enemies. There in uh, Revelation 19, let's look at the last part, verses 17 through 21, the very end of the chapter. John continues with his vision. He says, Then I saw an angel. Standing in the sun. Now, I don't know about you, I'm just trying to picture that. That's got to be cool, right? I mean, you, you look up and here is an angel standing in the sun. S-U-N, okay, sun. And uh, he called out in a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying high overhead, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of military commanders, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and of their riders, and the flesh of everyone, both free and slave, small and great. And then I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. 
But the beast was taken prisoner, and along with it the false prophet who had performed the signs in its presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image with these signs. Both of them, that is the beast and the false prophet, both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were killed with a sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds ate their fill of their flesh. Boy, this is a great lesson after a nice meal, isn't it? <laughs> oh, mercy. Well, notice here that this angel... So the, the one standing in the sun, summons birds to a horrific supper. And this builds on the imagery, again, of another Old Testament prophet, Ezekiel, who depicts God's curse on rebels. The curse includes not only death for the wicked, but the dishonoring of their bodies after death. Instead of receiving an honor, honorable burial, their bodies are devoured by birds. And... Um, Notice the, uh, the birds that are invited to this great supper of God is what it's called there in verse 17. Now again, that reminds me of Ezekiel, and I don't read Ezekiel much, but if you look in Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 17, listen to what the prophet says. It fits what you see right here in Revelation 19. In Ezekiel 39, 17, Son of man... This is what the Lord God says. Tell every kind of bird and all the wild animals, assemble and come. Gather from all around to my sacrificial feast that I am slaughtering for you a great feast on the mountains of Israel. You will eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the earth's princes, rams, lambs, male goats, and all the fattened bulls of Bashan. You will eat fat until you're satisfied and drink blood until you're drunk at my sacrificial, sacrificial feast that I prepared for you. At my table you will eat your fill of horses and riders. That's interesting, right? Horses and riders. Of mighty men and all the warriors, this is the declaration of the Lord God. Again, it's a picture that in the end times, God will invite all of the animals, particularly the birds, to gather and devour the flesh of all those that rebel against God. And you see it happen right here in Revelation 19, prophesied in Ezekiel 39. You know, let me jump for just a moment. I did say that this last part of Revelation 19 is the defeat and destruction of, of, of God's enemies. And we notice that as we read the last part of the chapter, you see the beast and the false prophet thrown alive into the lake of fire. And you might say, well, that's two out of the three. Uh, what happened to the devil? What happened to the dragon, Satan, the devil? What about him? Well, let me quickly just uh, jump ahead for a moment. Go to the next chapter, Revelation 20, and look particularly in verse 7 through 10. I just want to read this quickly. It says, When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison, and he'll go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. And again, that refers back to Ezekiel. Uh, Gog and Magog to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city, and then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so there is the rest of it. He defeats all his enemies, the beast, the false prophet, and even Satan, the devil himself. Uh, even though they all gather together on that stage uh, toward the very end to battle against uh, God and His people, He shows up and the battle is over uh, before it's even started. Dennis Johnson says, We're about to witness the Lord's last day's battle against the pagan aggressors called Gog and Magog in Ezekiel's prophecy and the battle's aftermath as the birds were filled with their flesh, Revelation 19.21. In the recapitulation or the replay, the pagan people deceived and gathered by the dragon to assault God's people are named Gog and Magog, confirming, and I like this, here's what Dennis Johnson says, he says, confirming that there's a link between Revelation 19 verses 17 through 21, 
the armies gathering together, and also Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10, again, all the armies gathering together against Christ and His people, uh, complementary visions of the same last battle. You know, notice the birds. We've talked about that. Notice the armies gathered for battle. John picks up the action here of the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies at the same point we've seen them before. They're gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. Now again, uh, to illustrate what I've been saying, a lot of times in Revelation he'll mention something and then a little bit later on he explains or expands it. Let me show you another example of that. Before we re read this in Revelation 19, where they gather together um, to, uh, to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army, there in Revelation 19, verse 19, go back a couple of three chapters to Revelation 16. In Revelation 16, let me pick up in verse 14. Revelation 16, 14, it says, For they are demonic spirits performing signs, who travel to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle on the great day of God the Almighty. And then Jesus interjects, Look, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who is alert and remains clothed so that he may not go around naked and people see his shame. So they assembled the kings at the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. So already in Revelation 16 we're told that demonic spirits are at work to get all these kings and all these people together for a battle on the great day of God Almighty, you know, setting the stage, making it happen. Then you fast forward another chapter, Revelation 17, verses 12 through 14. Revelation 17, verse 12, the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but they will receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose. They give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will conquer them because he's Lord of lords and King of kings. Those with him are called chosen and faithful. Now there, again, a war against the lamb. The lamb will win and he's called Lord of Lords and King of Kings. That's Revelation 17. And then we get to the end of Revelation 19, and there's the Lord fixing to make war. He wins, and he's called Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You see it? And so we, we've been building up. Uh, we, we've seen the, the, the preview of it, the trailer, if you will, and now we see it happen and so we've looked at the birds, we've looked at the armies that are gathered for battle. Now let's look for just a moment at the lake of fire. Notice that the beast and the false prophet, uh, there in verse 20, they're thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. I like what one scholar says. He says, the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels combined with the visions and revelation uh, have led Christian theologians to affirm that the final destination of the wicked is an eternal place of flames. Now, anyone who reads the references to the lake of fire in Revelation must conclude that John believed in unending, unending fiery torment for all the wicked. There is not the remotest possibility that he allows for annihilation of the wicked after a period of punishment. Um, E-C-T is what I've heard some people call it. Eternal conscious torment. That's what hell will be. It'll be eternal conscience, conscious torment. It'll last forever. You'll be aware of it. And it'll be pure torment. I don't know of anybody that would want to experience that forever and ever and ever. Many interpreters would see the language of fire and darkness and other descriptive terms to be metaphors. However, I believe the Bible sets us straight on that. If you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, listen to what Paul the Apostle says about the return of Christ. In 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 6, he says, Since it's just for God to repay with affliction those who have, uh, afflict you. Now, 
Think about that statement for a minute. Paul is talking to a church that's been persecuted by the world. And he's saying it is just for God to repay with affliction those who have afflicted you. And he says in verse 7, to give you relief who are afflicted along with us. And this will take place. When does this happen? It will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with His powerful angels when He takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will pay the penalty of eternal. That's not, a, that's not annihilation. Annihilation is just kind of like physical death. Boom, knock somebody over the head, they're gone and that's it. It's not like the video game. Black screen, game over, no more awareness. No, eternal destruction lasts forever. They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from His glorious strength on that day when He comes to be glorified by His saints and to be marveled at by all those who have believed because our testimony among you was believed. And so... There Paul is saying it's going to happen. It's eternal uh, punishment after the judgment. Now, let me give you a preview of coming attractions. As we finish Revelation, we're going to talk more about the lake of fire. It's mentioned five times in Revelation. This is just the first one. I'll very quickly give you a preview and we'll look at it more depth when we come up on it. But five passages in Revelation refer to the lake of fire as a final place of eternal uh, punishment, damnation. Uh, Here in Revelation 19.20, the beast and false prophet are thrown alive into the lake of fire with burning sulfur. In Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil is thrown into the lake of of burning sulfur where the beast and false prophet had been thrown. And they, they will be tormented day and night Forever and ever. That's a little bit more specific, isn't it? When you go, well, how long is eternal? Well, it's day and night, forever and ever, okay? And then in verse 15, Revelation 20, verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in, or excuse me, verse 14, I got ahead of myself. In Revelation 20, verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. Then verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And then the fifth reference in Revelation 21, verse 8, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderous, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur, This is the second death. We all will experience um, the first death, unless we're physically alive when the Lord comes back. Um, But it's not the the first death doesn't hurt you, because if you're born again, you die once because you live twice. But if you're not born again, you die twice, and that's it. Um. When we back up and look at this for a moment, it's a lot to take in, isn't it? Here is heaven opened up. There appears a rider on a white horse, and his name is Faithful and True, the Word of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and the battle is over just by the word of his mouth. And the, 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 the enemies of Christ are defeated and destroyed. But there's a takeaway here that I don't want you to miss. Going back to last week, when you look at the total picture of Revelation 19, I want you to realize that there are two suppers in Revelation 19. And this is where it hits you and I in everyday life. There's two suppers in Revelation 19. The first one is the wedding supper of the Lamb. Look in verse 7, 8, and 9. It says in Revelation 19, verse 7, Let us be glad, rejoice, and give Him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. And then He said to me, Write, Blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. 
He also said to me, these words of God are true. Today, while we have breath, the gospel of Jesus Christ goes out and the invitation is being sent to each one of us by the Spirit of God. He says this, Blessed are you if you're invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Mer blessed are you if you receive the invitation and you, you accept my sacrifice on the cross for your behalf and you clothe yourself in a robe of righteousness that I will give you, then one day you will be with me in glory and you'll be a part of that wedding supper of the Lamb. The alternative is clear. And the choice is yours. There is the wedding supper of the Lamb for believers. But then there's the great supper of God for unbelievers. As we looked at earlier in the latter part of Revelation 19, verse 17. He says, I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he called out in a loud voice saying, To all the birds flying high overhead, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, of military commanders, of the mighty, of horses and their riders, of everyone, both free and slave, small and great. And then in verse 21, the rest were killed with a sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds ate their fill of their flesh. When you boil it down, when Christ comes back, there's going to be two suppers. One you get to enjoy the menu. The other, you're on the menu. Pretty clear, isn't it? The, the marriage supper of the Lamb, we will be there with Him. And oh, how glorious it'll be. The great supper of God, it's not a pretty picture. You're on the menu. And as Kenneth uh, Kendall Easley says, he says, we're led to an unavoidable conclusion. At Christ's second coming, everyone alive will participate in one banquet or the other. Those who belong to Christ will share in the wedding supper of the Lamb. And those who belong to the beast will be on the menu for the great supper of God. I want to leave you with a parting thought tonight. The invitation... And Revelation 19, verse 9. When John said, he said to me, write, Blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And he also said to me, these words of God are true. Will you respond to God's invitation before it's too late? I don't know about you, but I don't want anyone alive when Christ does come back. To say, I wish we'd all been ready. Because right now is the time. Right now is the day. If God is speaking to your heart, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. If God is speaking to your heart today, then He's talking to you. And He's talking to you because He wants you to respond to Him right now. Okay? Now, He's not going to put any pressure on you. But he will convict you because he wants you to be aware of three things. He wants you to be aware of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He wants you to realize why you will be judged on judgment day. We've all sinned against God. He wants us to realize that he is righteous. He alone is the just judge. And he, he will judge righteously and justly. And uh, when we realize that we're a sinner, when we realize that he is God and we're not, then all of a sudden judgment is reasonable. And so the Holy Spirit will persuade you and convince you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And when He does, it's my prayer that you will say, you know, I want to respond to the invitation of God before it's everlasting too late. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be saying, I wish we'd all been ready. You know, I was 17 years old when I heard the gospel. And that is what moved me to say yes to Jesus. It was the simple fact that I was told that he's coming back, he's coming back, he's coming back. And the question remained, will I be ready? Will I be ready? And that is a question that every single one of us needs to answer. And it's my prayer tonight that you will respond to the invitation of God.
before it's too late. And anytime you want to talk, I'm going to be around tonight. I'd love to talk with you. Um, and uh, you can always text my next step to 9400 um, if you're watching. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to encourage you. Well, let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. Thank you for this word from the word. Lord, I pray that you would capture our, uh, our attention and our affections tonight. Lord, may we realize that you are coming back. That one day heaven will open and you will appear in the clouds. And Lord, you will be ready to, to rule. You'll be ready to reign. You'll be ready to judge. And Lord, I pray that we'll all be ready. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.